in action. Here we go. We are going to begin tonight with leadership lesson four. This is the final lesson in this series that I have been teaching. And tonight we are going to be talking about soul winning. There is nothing more important than winning souls for God. Because that's what we are commanded to do. In all truthfulness, you cannot call yourself a leader if you do not win souls. We are to set the example. And if we're not willing to invite, to teach, to pray, to fast, to bring people to church and befriend the lost, then how can we call ourselves a leader? And I'm going to go a step further. How can we even call ourselves a Christian? Because the very word Christian means to be Christ-like. And souls were the first and foremost thing on God's mind. Proverbs 11 and 30 says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. You want to be a wise man? You want to be a wise woman? Win souls. You're bringing people into the kingdom of God. How important is soul winning? Well, we are told in the first three books of the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that we are to go out and win souls. Matthew says to go and make disciples of all nations to teach them to observe all things that they have been taught. Mark said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Luke says that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So you can see just from these three books in the Bible that we as Christians, we as servants of God, and we as leaders of men have an obligation to win souls. And if we are not winning souls, then we are not being productive. And basically, for those that says, well, I'm, I'm not going to win any souls. You're not living in obedience to Scripture. Now, I do believe in the law of the harvest. Okay? Sometimes somebody may come along and somebody may plant the seed in Brother Holland. Then somebody else may come along and water that seed. And somebody else may come along and till the land. And take care of that seed and somebody else come along and reap the harvest. So I do believe in the process of the harvest. But at the same time, in the process of the harvest, you still had four different people working on that one seed. When you do nothing but warm a pew and never reach the lost, then you're really accomplishing nothing. Our job as Christians is to reproduce and to bring more sheep into the fold. God's plan... For his church is growth. Luke 14, 23 tells us, And the Lord said unto the servants, Go into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in. Why? That my house may be full. This is not the will of God. When our church will seat 150 and we have 50 in church, that is not the will of God. When we have Sunday school rooms that has two children or one child or no child, that is not the will of God. When we have a van that's not being used to go out and bring souls into the house of God, that is not the will of God. We are to go. And sometimes going means sacrifice. My dad worked swing shift. Anybody, everybody in here know what swing shift is? Izzy, sit down, baby, where he can see. Everybody in here know what swing shift is? Swing shift is where... Um, you get up and you go to work from 7 to 3, 3 to 11, and 11 to 7. There's three different shifts, and you're going to work for approximately seven days, one of those three shifts. My dad, I've seen him many a times, work 3 to 11. Come 3 to 11 means that that's when he clocked out, but he might not get to leave the plant till maybe 12 or 1 o'clock in the morning. He'd come home, get a shower, get out of his work clothes, get a shower, 
go to bed, get back up at five, be on his bus route for the church at six, be back at church off of that bus route and have those kids there at 10 because he drove the furthest extremes of the bus route. And he would have had those kids at the church for Sunday school at 9.30, quarter to 10. And then he would go home after church, go run the tape ministry after he left the tape ministry, go home, go to sleep, sleep maybe an hour and go back because on Sundays is when the shifts changed and he'd hit the 3 to 11 shift. They caused sacrifice. But do you know what that dedication did for those men that was running that bus ministry? They worked, and they worked hard, and just about every man that ran that bus ministry did a swing shift. And we ran, I think it was 14 different buses. And I'm not talking about vans. I'm talking about school buses. We ran over 700 in our church, and I probably 50% of them were on buses. But it took sacrifice. It took prayer. We did Sunday school marches downtown brunswick georgia we had clowns and puppets and candy rains we did sunday school parades with police escorts but it took dedication we can't sit there and say oh i want that well why don't you be a clown and we'll go have a parade in the park this no i'm not going to dress up as no clown well then help us bring some no, i'm not bringing any candy either it takes sacrifice and it takes dedication in order to have this stuff and we are commanded by God. No, we're not commanded to have a candy rain. But we are commanded to go out and compel them to come in. We don't need. Let me tell you something we don't need. We don't need uh, another outreach program. There's been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of outreach programs written. We don't need another billboard that says Jesus saves. We know Jesus saves. So does the rest of the world. We don't need another yard sign that says we're praying for our community. People pass the yard signs and say, yep, and they go on. Now, these things are good additions, but these things do not win souls. And I'm going to prove that biblically. What wins souls? Me going out and making a personal contact with that individual. Me going out and say, hey, sis. I'd like for you to come to church with me tomorrow. We got a special. So won't you come to church with me and we'll meet at Dunkin' Donuts before church and have a donut and a coffee. It means making a personal touch. I can stick a sign up in my yard all day long, but that sign hasn't won a soul yet. Okay. It's nice to look at, but it's not accomplishing anything if they cannot put a face with that sign. Why do you think politicians put their pictures on their signs and their ads? Because before you read that sign, you test yourself the next time. Before you read that sign, you go look at that picture. We have got to put faces on these names. Let me tell you this also, and I want you to think about what I'm fixing to say. Faith without works is dead. We heard about that a lot yesterday. Belief without action is worthless. And knowledge without noticing and doing something about it is useless. You can know the word of God and still go to hell. Satan knows the word of God. Satan knows who God is. Satan used to guard his throne. And where is he today? He is hell bound. With no hope of repentance. We're not saved by works. We know this. However, we do live by our works. Our works is what compels people to come in. John chapter 17 is the longest prayer in the Bible. And in John chapter 17, we see where Jesus is praying for his followers. He didn't pray that they have a new Sunday school program. He didn't even pray that they have great miracles and wonders. He prayed that they would get a glimpse of what it meant to be sent. Because we are called to go out, not to warm pews, but to go out and bring them in to the house of God. He went on to say that wanting them in verse 18 to catch a glimpse of what it is to be sent. He said, as he, speaking of himself, Jesus, was sent into the world. 
so are we sent. You know what that means? That means we need to catch the vision that Jesus had. We need to get a hunger for souls. It used to be an old song that Brother Shepherd, that my husband was talking about yesterday, used to sing. God lay some soul upon my heart and touch that soul through me. You know, I pray God put somebody in my path that I can talk to about you today. We need to learn to be sensitive to the people around us and their needs. God has a work. And a mission plan for each one of us here tonight. God has a work and a mission plan for every person that sits on these pews. Our role is to bring people to Jesus. We can't force them. We know that. Wish we could. One of our assistant pastors and I used to have a standing joke. We baptized so many people. And you know how it is. Sometimes you baptize them and out the door you go and you don't see them again. And we'd baptize them they'd be gone. We'd, and some of them would even get the Holy Ghost, but they just didn't stick. They didn't have the desire to stay. So finally, one day we were joking. It was just he and I and my husband talking. I said, I tell you what, Austin. I said, you baptize them. I'll shoot them. Then we'll repent. and We'll make sure we get into heaven, but we'll make sure they get there too. And sometimes that's the way we feel because we get frustrated. But we got to remember, we cannot force people to live for God. We're not going to be held accountable for whether they live for God or not. But we are going to be held accountable for whether or not we share the word of God with them or not. Therein lies the difference. We can be the greatest singer, the greatest musician, the greatest teacher, the greatest artist, the greatest organizer, the greatest PA, the greatest recorder. We could be the greatest of every aspect of life. But if we fail to win others for Christ, then everything else that we're doing is in vain. We can have the biggest church in town. We are going to have the biggest church in town. But if we lose our vision and we lose our perspective and we compromise on God and his work, then we have accomplished nothing and it is all in vain. We want to remember it's God and his mission first. We're told in Romans chapter 1 by Paul. Paul tells us that we are to serve God by telling others, by spreading the gospel. That whole chapter speaks of spreading the gospel. It starts with Paul talking about how he spreads the gospel and how the church needs to spread the gospel. So once again, we're reminded, all through Scripture, we're reminded what our goal as Christians is. It is to spread the Word of God. There are many ways that we spread the Word of God through the way we live, through the way, the examples that we've set, through living it in front of them, through teaching home Bible studies, through teaching five-minute-on-the-street-corner Bible studies. Ever done that? Somebody will ask you a question and you answer it. And you sit there and you talk to them about God. And I try to make sure before I walk away from that situation, whatever question they ask me, I lead it to the plan of salvation. Because that question may not get them to heaven or hell, but the plan of salvation will. So we want to make sure that we get that to them. So we have an obligation to do this. How important is it that we do this? How important is it that we reach out to others? Does it matter? Does it really matter? Let me tell you just how important it is. And I shared this story several months ago in church. So if you um, heard it that night, here's a refresher course. Lynette Forum was a 14-year-old runaway, abused, neglected, living on the streets in California. One chilly morning as she sat on a sidewalk, she said the first person, that will love me. I will love them for the rest of my life. As she sat there, a hand touched her shoulder. And she heard a voice say, If you will come home with me, I will love you for the rest of my life. Lynette Foreman got up and went home that day with Charles Manson. In 1975, she attempted to kill President Ford. And she said in an interview that she never really wanted to kill him. She just wanted a platform 
to honor her first love. Form was asked if she regretted the things that she had done, and she said, no, I would do it all again because, you see, Charles first loved me. When there is a harvest, the first combine in the field is the combine that does the reaping. We, you, 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 myself, we need to be the first combines in the fields of our cities and our communities. How different would Form's life have been if we had reached her before Satan did? Maybe President Ford would have never got shot. Maybe she'd have never been part of the Sharon Tate massacre. Maybe she wouldn't have spent most of her life in prison. Maybe she wouldn't be living in California today as a, and this is an oxymoron, born-again pagan. Jesus loves the forms of this world. And yes, Jesus loves the Charles Mansons of this world. But we need to get this message out to them. Because I'm going to tell you something. There's more Charles Mansons out there. And there's more Lynette Forms, Froms out there. And we, where are we in their lives? Where are we in their situations? And what are we doing to help another massacre from not happening? It's important. Our job is very important. And we need to understand that. Now, once again, I want to read Luke 14 and um, 23 again where it says, The Lord said unto the servant, Go into the highways and the hedges. Go into the highways and the hedges. It don't say go and sit on church pew where your prettiest outfit and your fanciest hat. Y'all know I love my hat. And make sure you know every word to the course and that you know where all the little symbols go. And make sure you know just when to say amen. That's not what it says. It says, go into the highways and hedges. Now, don't go out of here and say, Sister Jesus Penn said, don't come to church. Because I did not say that. Because it also says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. We need to be in church. But the point is, there is more to church than just Wednesday and Sunday morning and Sunday night. Church is 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You are the church. And when we as American Christians get it through our heads that the church is not these four walls, this is the place that we come. We congregate together to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, to lead others. This is the hospital for the sick. This is the place that they need to be and they need to see us as the nurses and the doctors, spiritually speaking, in here helping them get their feet on the right path so that they can escape the damnations of hell. They're tired of weak Christianity and they're tired of fake Christianity. And compel them to come in. Why does God want all this done? So his house will be full. Now, the Bible tells us to compel them. Jackson, what do you think the word compel means? To lead them to the truth? I'm doing mind blanks all of a sudden. Sis, what do you think compel means, Andrea? Convince? Sister Nate, what do you think compel means? Do all you can do. Brother Holland? Everything they said. Brother Nathan? Ditto? Sister Nathan is the closest one. I looked it up in the dictionary because I've heard different definitions. I said, let me, let me take this step further. It actually means to force, to obligate someone to do something, to drive forcibly. To constrain somebody to do something. Now, I've never seen a billboard constrain anybody. But now I can put on a sales pitch. And I can put on a guilt trip. That'll have the tears flowing. That's compelling. There's, I heard one preacher preach one time and he said, take a rope, do a lasso, catch them and drag them in. 
once they realize what you're saving them from, they will thank you. We need to be serious. We, are, we say all that in fun, but we need to be serious about soul winning. Somebody was serious about you. I remember the night I got the Holy Ghost, I'd been seeking the Holy Ghost for quite some time. And one night, one of the sisters in the church said, I've had enough of this. I was down there at the little altar in my little corner that I always went to. She ran up behind me and she took her thumbs and stuck them underneath my arms and jabbed upward and picked me up off that floor. And she said, now that's enough of this. You're getting the Holy Ghost and you're getting it right now. She laid her hands on my head. Next thing I knew, I was speaking in tongues. She was speaking in tongues, she was going to break my neck. Okay. But it was, she was said, it's time to get serious. It's time to quit playing patty cake, Cindy, with God, and let's get serious. And that sometimes, although I don't want nobody jabbing their thumbs underneath somebody's armpits and snatching them off the floor, but sometimes we have to get down and talk to them and let them know just how close to eternity they are. I was talking to somebody one day and I was explaining something to them because they had asked me, how to handle a situation, and I was telling them what to do. They said, oh, but I don't want to offend them. And I told them, I said, brother, listen to me. You are loving them straight into hell. And we live in a world today that is so scared of offending somebody. If offending me means keeping me out of hell, then by all means offend me. Because I do not want, nor do I want my family to spend eternity in hell. So, what is the answer to winning souls? Take your finger and do this number. You're the answer. Because you're the only one that could do it. I can stand up here and say, Jackson, we need to go out this week, take the young people, and y'all go knock doors. But I can't make you do it. You got to love God enough to have the desire to do it. Brother Holland, you got to love souls enough to have the desire to do it. And Brother Holland says, all right, Sunday school, let's go invite Sunday school. Let's have a Sunday school church visitation. We need to be here. We need to have a desire to see souls saved. We got to get involved. The souls, as I've already showed you, needs a face. Someone to care. Someone to love them. Someone to even be angry at. And someone to vent to. I knocked on a door one day in New York. And a man came to the door and he said, yes, ma'am, can I help you? Well, his attitude changed between the yes, ma'am, may I help you? And I invited him to church. No, I'm not going to church. You could just take your tracks and go on to get off my property. I'm not going to church. Okay. But I want you to know God loves you. See, I don't scare easy and I'm as tenacious as an old bulldog. Okay, and so I told him, I said, can I ask you a question? And he looked at me, and he said, yes. I said, why are you so angry at the church, using it in a generic term? And he said, because there is no God. And I said, there's not? He said, no, there is not, and only fools believe in him. I said, I'm a very foolish woman then. And he looked at me. He said, you would say that about yourself? I said, yes. I said, why do you not believe in God? And so he gave me this long, drawn out thing about why he didn't believe in God and how God was invented to take care of those that were too ignorant to be educated. They were not educated and they were ignorant. And he went on and on and on. And I said, mm -hmm. and I said, and um, what organization does your father pastor in? He stopped and he looked at me and he said, how did you know my father pastored? I said, because you believe in God. And he said, say what? I just told you I didn't believe in God. I said, no, you believe in God. I said, but somewhere in your past, you prayed a prayer that God didn't answer the way you wanted him to answer it. And you're angry at God because God said no. And the, I watched his tears rolled up in this man's eyes. And he started crying. And I said, let me tell you something. It's not the child of God that's ignorant. It's the one who denies the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who is ignorant. 
And I said, it's time for you to pick up a telephone and call your daddy. And it's time for the prodigal son to go home. The next time I talked to the man, he had made reconnection. He had reconnected with his father. And he was making an attempt to go back to church. That was somebody that needed to vent. That was somebody that needed a face. That was somebody that needed somebody to snap them back into reality. And I'm going to tell you something. We need to be knowledgeable when we go out and we witness. Because you are going to be facing things in this world today that we have not, in our generation, have not had to face. Now, there's nothing new under the sun. Everything that is, has been, and everything that has been is still going to come. But at the same time, there are things that we're facing that our children's going to face, that our grandchildren's going to face, that this generation's going to face, and even my generation's going to face, that we have not had to face before. We in America have really had it easy in living for God. But there are things coming, and there are things that we are seeing that we need to um, develop some intestinal fortitude. That simply means guts. We need to get a backbone and we need to quit being wishy-washy Christians. And heaven help us quit being Sunday morning Christians. Do I need to say it again? Quit being Sunday morning Christians. As I've already said, we are Christians 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. And if we're not, then we need to find us an altar somewhere and take care of us so that we can go take care of the world. Ouch, oi, oh me, pull your toes in. You may look up again. I'm done. <laughs> okay. There was another man. How important is it? How important is it to get the word to them and not to leave gaps? I knocked on another man's door one day, and when he opened the door, he had a bottle of pills in his hands. And I looked at that bottle of pills, and I said, did I interrupt something? He said, yes, who are you, what do you want? And I told him who I was, told him what I wanted. I said, I'm here to invite you to church. Actually, I'm here to teach you a Bible study. And he looked at me. I wasn't prepared to teach a Bible study because I didn't. At that time, I was doing exploring God's word, and they were in those big charts that's about the size of this board here. And so, I wasn't prepared for that. But I changed. I said, "I'm here to teach you a Bible study." And he said, "Well, you've got about thirty minutes. I was fixing to commit suicide when you knocked on my door." I said, "Okay, let's talk." So we sat on the front steps of his house, and I told him, "I said, there is a God." whose name is Jesus Christ. And y'all all know the story, so I'm not going to sit here and totally reiterate it to you. But I told him how much God loved him and what God did for him and this, that, and the other. And I kept telling him how much he needed God and that suicide was not the answer because if you commit suicide, that's the last sin and it can't be repented of. And sin cannot enter into heaven. And he sat there and he looked at me and he said, but you don't understand I said, what do I not understand? I said, you repent of your sins. You get baptized in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. And I said, then we're going to, your sins are going to be washed away. And you're going to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And that's God living inside of you. And you're going to speak in a language that's only between you and God. He said, you don't understand. And I said, what do I not understand? And he said, my uncle is the Monsignor of the Catholic Diocese here. And he said, they will excommunicate me. And I said, and if you die right now by committing suicide, does it matter? Because they're going to excommunicate you if you commit suicide. You can't even be back buried on their holy ground. And he stopped and he looked at me. He said, I hadn't thought about that. I said, okay. So I'm saving you from two problems. One, suicide. And another excommunication. I said, so let's talk some more. So we talked for quite some time. And I watched as this young man repented. And he said, I want to know more. And I told him, I said, okay. I said, we will have more to discuss. I said, I'm going to set up a time. And me and my husband are going to come and teach you the Bible study. We had already had probably a good hour and a half's conversation. I set up a time. I was supposed to go the next day to teach this young man the Bible study. That night, I got a phone call 
from the Monsignor. And he said, Mrs. Yuzapan. And I said, yes, sir. And he identified himself. I said, my pleasure. What can I do for you, sir? He said, I understand you were at my nephew's house today. I said, yes, sir. He said, don't you go back. And I said, sir. He said, don't go back. And I said, why? He said, because if you go back, you will damn his soul to hell and I will damn yours to hell. And I just busted out laughing. I couldn't help it. I just lost control there for a few minutes. And he said, you think that's funny? I said, yes, sir, I do. I said, because you do not have the power to send him to hell or me. And I said, most especially me. I said, you may convince him you can. I said, but you can't touch me. And he said, I am telling you now, do not go back. I said, well, that is his decision, not yours. So I hung up the phone and I went back the next day with my husband and I. We went back to teach him his Bible study. And the Monsignor and the church had come in and moved him lock, stock, and barrel. So I went over to the Monsignor's home, knocked on the door. He would not come to the door. I spoke to his secretary and I said, I'd like to know where so-and-so is. And she said, we cannot give you that information. And they flat refused. So what I did is I prayed. I said, God, that young man, when I left him, had the plan of salvation. He had asked you to forgive him. Now I'm going to ask you to take it from here because I could do no more. So never walk away. Never put off tomorrow what can be done today. Because that may have been his last opportunity to hear the word of God. And I can stand before God with a clear conscience. And he'll stand before God and say, I knew, I heard, I know. So we want to make sure that we are instant in season and out of season. We want to make sure that we are prayed up, studied up. We want to know that when we stand before that demon, we can say, I bind you in the name of Jesus Christ. Now leave me alone. And we can go on with our Bible study or go on with our day. We need to make sure that that soul that we're talking to at that moment gets all the truth that we can give them. So that if I walk away and I never see them again, I could stand before God with a clean conscience. And hopefully somebody else can come behind me in the laws of the harvest and finish planting the seed or harvesting the seed that I planted at that moment. Now you ask yourself, okay, so you're telling us all this, Sister Yuzapan. How do we do it? Glad you asked. Number one, invite with a purpose. Okay. Would you like to come and go to church with me this Sunday, Mr. Holland? Well, I'm glad to hear that, but most people's going to say, no, I'm busy. What mistake did I just make? I asked an open-ended question. Never ask a yes or no question. Okay, because when you ask a yes or no question like that, most of the time, they're going to say no. Okay, just change the verbiage just a little bit. Mr. Holland, you know what? We're having a special service this weekend. I sure would love for you to come with me. It's, you're busy? Well, I tell you what, it starts at 10 o'clock. What time are you busy? All day? Why don't you drop by for at least an hour? Can you do that? I think you could do that. I mean, uh, re uh, reality, what time do you go to work, Mr. Holland? Eight, Eight o'clock? Well, I tell you what, then. If you've really got to be at work, what time do you get off? Five? Okay. Uh, you get off just in time for our Sunday night service. I tell you what, I'll come by your house. I'll pick you up. We'll stop by Dunkin' Donuts. See, you started me with this donut issue. We'll stop by Krispy Kreme. We'll get a coffee. Okay, we'll get a coffee to Krispy Kreme donut. And we'll head out to the church. And you, I'd love to have you sit by me in church. What's the difference? I was persistent. I didn't let him say no. He might have said it, but I didn't hear it. We need to learn. A lot of times when somebody says no, okay, I don't want to offend them, so I'm going to back off. Or I don't want to be pushy. You know, there's pushy and then there's pushy. You, go, you ever been in a store and somebody go, can I help you? You sure I can't help you? Can I help you? You look like you want to buy that video. Are you, can, you sure I can't help you? You're in my space. But 
may I help you with something? And then they just kind of, after I've said no, they kind of glide to the side and they're kind of watching out of the corner. They're close enough where if I need something, I can call them, but they're far enough away that they're not in my space. We need to be persistent in dealing with souls because that persistence can make the difference. I told my daughter one time when she was fighting so hard against the church, I said, you can kick. You can scream, you can get mad at me, you can cuss me out, and she did a few times. You can do whatever you want to. She wasn't living in my home. You can do whatever you want to, but I am standing between you and the gates of hell, and the day will come when you'll thank me for it. Today, my beautiful 25-year-old daughter is living for God, teaching a connect group class, and singing in the choir, and raising her two babies in the church. That's what persistence does. That's what persistence does. We need to treat every soul. I need to remember to treat every soul I come across like it was my daughter. Like it was my son. Because I don't want people in hell. Be excited about what God is doing, number two. People can see through fake. I can tell. Lord have mercy. I've told people sometimes. They'll come up and they'll start lathering it on. And I'll kind of cock my eye at them sometimes because you can tell fake. And I'll say, boy, the wading boots are getting awful high in here. And they'll just look at me like, what? what, what? It's okay. Let's, let's just tone it down a few notches. <laughs> let's tone it down. The world sees that. The world sees it. They've seen too many Tammy Faye Bakers and Jimmy Swaggarts. They want reality. They want real. They want to see the lame walk. They want to see the dumb talk. They want to see people filled with the Holy Ghost. They want to see the miracle. We talk about it. We tell them it's real. Now we need to show them it's real. And how does this happen? It don't happen by warming church pews. It happens through prayer and fasting and obedience to the scripture and doing what we have to do. People want people who care. Number three, know the details and be prepared to answer questions. There is nothing more embarrassing than inviting somebody to church and saying, Sister Nathan, I'd like for you to come and go to church with me Sunday. And Sister Nathan looked at me and said, well, what time does church start? You know, I don't know. Let me call the pastor and find out. It's your church. Know what time church starts. Know what the address is. Know what... The schedule of services is. Know who the Sunday school teachers' names are and the age group, especially if you're talking to somebody who has kids. Be knowledgeable. Not only of the personal information of the church, be knowledgeable of Scripture. Because I'm going to tell you something. People out there quote some funny things. Okay? And you've got to know how to answer their quotes. You know, there's two scriptures in the Bible. One says, Judas went out and hanged himself. And the other one says, go ye therefore and do likewise. Do you know that there is a church in the United States? It is called the Church of Euthanasia. It's out of California. Imagine that. And they teach assisted suicide, abortion, and euthanasia. That is their platform. They teach anybody over a certain age should be killed. And it's not a Star Trek movie. It's reality. They build death machines. They believe in abortion. They believe children that nobody should, really shouldn't be having children because of the fact that the earth is overpopulated. And they will use scripture twisted, like I just twisted those two scriptures, to back up what they're saying. Now, if you don't know how to combat, if you never read the word of God and don't know the word of God, how are you going to combat that? Remember, the devil believes too. So be knowledgeable. There are times that when you, you I, I know a lot of scriptures, but I do not retain numbers very well. So to tell you 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, I could no more tell you what that scripture is than man in the moon. Okay, but now I can quote scriptures, but I can't remember where they're at in the Bible. 
I do not retain numbers. So one day I was in a cemetery. Imagine that. I was in a cemetery, and I was walking around the cemetery, and this man came out from nowhere. And when he came out, he just started talking to me, and I'm looking around because I still don't see no vehicle as to where he came from. And he starts asking me questions about the Bible and God and all this stuff. And I'm sitting there going, God, I need your help. Give me the word of wisdom because I don't know where the chapters and verses are. And I felt as God moved on me and I started quoting chapters and verses to this gentleman. And he was writing them down and listening and all this stuff. So you can also pray and ask God for the word of wisdom. But also the word of wisdom comes because the Bible also tells us to study, to show thyself, to prove a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. So we need to study the word of God. Number four, if prayer is requested, then go ahead and pray for them. Don't wait for the church service. Don't wait to get a hold of the pastor. That time might not come. Pray for them right then, right there. I've shocked a few people because they'll say, Pray for me, Mrs. Yuzapan. I said, sure, come on, right now. And I've prayed for him in the middle of Western Sizzling, and I've prayed for him in the middle of Walmart, and I've prayed for him in the middle of the mall. I've prayed for him on the street car. I don't care. Satan's not ashamed of what he does. Why should we be? See, it's time we as Christians get a backbone. Number five, be persistent, as we've already talked about. Okay, I know you can't come Sunday morning, but Sunday night, you get off five. And if you don't get off till seven o'clock and we're out of church, how about we get together Monday morning for a cup of coffee? It's a good time to bring that one hour Bible study with you to the coffee breakfast. And even if he doesn't want to take it right then, that's a very self-explanatory Bible study. You can always say, take this home and do it in your spare time. And then follow up in a day or two and say, hey, have you had a chance to do that Bible study? Martin to his marvelous light, our brand new life. I love the self-explanatory ones because a lot of times people say, I don't have time for that right now. Oh, take it with you. And it shocks them because you're giving them a little Bible study thing there in the form of a devotion and they'll take it home. And most of the time, people I have handed it to has actually done the Bible study. So that's a good outreach tool. Make use of it. We as a church try our best to provide everybody with outreach tools. We just came out with the new tracks. And that's a Bible study within itself. We've got the business cards. We have Bible studies. So we try to provide it. There's no reason that our Bible studies, I should have to wipe a layer of dust off before I put them out on the, pool, on the table for the new batch. These Bible studies should be being used. Now, number six. This is a biggie. Are you ready for it? When you invite somebody to church, you be there too. I mean, I had a woman come up to me one time and ask me, where, not here, this was at another church, asked me where sister so-and-so was. And I said, I don't know. She's not here tonight. She said she has been after me for two years to come to church. So she called me yesterday and invited me to church. And she's not here. That tells me she didn't think it was very important. She walked out of the church and I never saw her again. We need to practice what we preach. Now, I know that sometimes something comes up. You get sick. You, you can't come to church. You're in no condition to come to church. You get called in to work at the last minute. Something breaks and you got to get it fixed before you can get here. We understand that. But when we lay out of the house of God just for the sake of laying out of the house of God, then we are going to be held accountable unto God. Who do you invite to church? Everybody. Everybody, every place, all the time. But now I will be the first to tell you, realistically, coming from corporate America, in direct sales, I understand you got to have a plan. And if, because if you don't have a plan, then you plan to fail. Okay? So, let's talk about a plan. Because I can say I'm going to invite five people to church this week. 
and get busy with my day-to-day -day life and forget about the fact that have I invited anybody today? Well, have I supposed to? Did I? Let's talk about it. Let's get a plan. You have what is called a circle of influence. The center of that circle of influence is your family, your friends, and your co-workers. This is people that you see every day. You see your family at least every other day if they live in town. Every day if you live at home. Okay? Family reunions. We see our families quite frequently. How many of them are not living for God? And when was the last time you approached them? How about your co-worker that you sit beside every day at work or you speak to when you punch it in the time clock? When was the last time you invited them to church? How about friends that live next door, the neighbor that you wave to at the mailbox every morning as you're going to work? This is your inner circle. Okay. This is your middle circle ring. Then you have your inner, inner circle. These are the male person that you leave the bottle of water out for because it's so hot. How about a bottle of water and an invitation to church? How about our nurses and our doctors that we might go to see this week for an appointment? How many times have we walked through a hospital and passed 20 or 30 people on the way to a patient's room and not even hand out a church card? Grocery clerks, I don't know about y'all, but I'm at the grocery store two or three times a week. Okay, so how many times have you walked through that grocery store? If you go through the same line, you see, ah, there's my friend, don't even know her name or his name, but I'm going through that line because I know they'll get my stuff right. They won't break my eggs. They won't go on the bottom of the bag. Okay, but how many times have we invited them to church? Classmates, for those that are still in school or in college. These are just people that we just associate with on a day-to-day -day basis. Then you have your outer circle. These are people that you may see weekly or bi-weekly. Your bank clerks. How many still go to a bank? I don't either. I do it all online. But every now and then somebody will give me a check and I'll go cash it. Okay? So, but even then, you know, we know people that work in banks. We're fixing as a church to start working with banks. So as we do that, we need to make sure we're inviting these people, Brother Nathan, Brother Yusufan, and board, inviting these people to church. We're working with real estate agents right now, and they have been invited to church, but we want to be persistent. How, those of you that goes to gyms, how about some of those people that you're running that treadmill with? Invite them. How about the person that you hand your monthly gym fee to? Invite them to church. These are people we don't even think about, but we need to invite them to church. What is your harvest field? You need to identify your harvest field. How about non-believers? Well, I don't associate with non-believers. Start associating with them. Are we better than Jesus Christ? The Bible tells us he sat and ate with the sinners and the publicans. Okay, now, you know, no, I don't need to use that phrase. We don't become kissing cousins with them. We know that. Okay, but if you don't show yourself friendly to people in the world, then how are you going to win the world? Let me tell you something. I know a church right now. And I got madder than a wet hornet. That's pretty mad. That closed down its bus ministry. Because they didn't want to bus children from the other side of town. They weren't in the same social class as the church board. I don't want to be those people when they stand before God. Because there's going to be blood on their hands. We need to get off our high horses. And get down here where we need to be with God. And the people. So make some friends. If you don't know any non-believers, make some friends. Well, Sister Jesus Pam, what is a non-believer? I'm going to tell you something. I don't care how many times they go to church. And I don't care how many deacons. I don't even care if they're a preacher. 
If they do not believe in the word of God as the word of God is written, repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, living a godly, holy life, separated from the world, obeying the scripture. They may love God, but they still don't have the truth. And there is a big difference between the two. Okay? Please understand what I'm saying. There is a difference between the two. Judas loved God. Judas walked with God. Judas even knew scripture, but Judas was still lost. Backsliders. How many know some backsliders? We know backsliders from right here. I know backsliders all over the United States. We have backsliders that's moving in to Rocky Mount area. We need to reach them. The prodigal children need to come home. Let me tell you something that a woman said to me this week, and it's, it's been tugging at my heartstrings all week long. But I went and visited a woman who was a backslider. And she told me, she said, when I came back to God, I had no expectations. And I looked at her and said, what did you mean? She said, because when I came back to God, I had no promises that God would take me back. And that just chilled my soul because I thought about it. God promises the gift of Holy Ghost. God promises to forgive us of our sins. God promises us this as sinners because he's not willing that any should be perished. But when we slam the door in his face, then it is his grace and his mercy and his love and the prayers of the saints of God that reopens that door. And she said, I had people that was praying for me. And she said, and God heard their prayers. And I just, it just got me. It got me. Because Brother Holland, I hadn't quite thought about it that way. Because I walked out on God one time. And I had a praying mama that prayed and asked God not to slam the door on my life. It was posted on Facebook today that... I'm so glad I serve a God that never closes the door. I got to disagree with that statement. I can prove in scripture that there does come a time when God shuts the door. And I don't want to be there. And I don't want to see it closed on anybody else. So we need to reach the backsliders. Our prodigal children need to come home. Our neighbors. There's, a, you know, used to, we knew all of our neighbors in our neighborhood. Now we're lucky if we even know the person that lives beside us. Why? Because we're just too busy. We don't take time to knock on their door anymore and say, Hey, I'm Cindy. Just moved into the neighborhood. Not me. I've already met the neighbors on both sides and ones that lives across the street from me. So, And I've been walking the neighborhood. And when I see somebody in their yard, I say, Hi, I'm Cindy. I just moved down the street here. You know? And um, so, you know, we have to put forth that effort. So that we can get to meet them. So get out. Meet your neighbors. Well, let's see. What holiday is coming up? Labor Day. Labor Day. Okay. Well, I don't think we... Uh, Thanksgiving. I'll pull that one out of the air. Bake some turkey cookies and go give them to your neighbor. You know? Gobble, gobble, gobble. You got a neighbor? I got a neighbor right now that lives next door to me that has no family. No one at all. So when I cook Thanksgiving dinner this year... Turkey cookies, shaped like turkeys. Cookies shaped like turkeys. <laughs> she has, huh? Oh, okay. Hmm. I, I'm going to have to get creative here. She has no family. All her family has passed away. So Thanksgiving's coming around. She's going to get an invite to my table for Thanksgiving. I don't want her spending Thanksgiving by herself. We have to go out and make the effort. Because the world kind of looks at us like we're a little strange sometimes. Sometimes they're right. I know I am. Okay? But we have to put forth to show them that, no, we're not snake handlers. And no, I don't have a bottle of whiffle dust up here that I'm going to throw on you. And no, we don't swing from the chandeliers. That's very dangerous. Very <laughs> and all this stuff. We're normal, everyday people who are in love with the king of kings so let's show our neighbors that our co-workers now i'm going to tell you something i'm not ashamed of showing my co-workers who god is and i'm not ashamed to stand in my ground okay 
when you work with people, I don't know how, if you've had people that's been very aggressive with you, but I've had people get aggressive with me at work and tell me, I don't care if you are a pastor's wife, you'll do this. And I'm, no, I won't. No, I won't. You know, you knew when you hired me that this would not be done, so fire me. And if you fire me, we'll go on from there. We need to learn to stand our ground. But too many times we want to back up to the world and back up from our co-workers because we don't want to stand our ground. We just don't want to. Maybe there's a little bit of fear. Maybe there's a little bit of shame. Maybe there's a little bit of not enough knowledge that you don't know what your ground are, don't know what your legal um, reasoning is. But we need to show our co-workers, just think, what the White House would be like if we got every one of our senators and congressmen and all of them filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized in Jesus' name, and living a godly, holy life. Man, you're talking about a miracle, number one. Number two, you're talking about revival in the United States. But that's why the Bible tells us to pray for our leaders. And I'm going to tell you something. Even if you don't like the elected officials... Pray for them. We are commanded by Scripture to pray for those in power. And then go out and vote. Number five, your classmates. And as you can see, this list can go on and on and on and on. Because you're in touch. Each Andrea is in touch with different people than I am every day. Sister Nate's in touch with different people than Jackson, you are. And Jackson, you're in touch with different people than Brother Holland. And Brother Holland, you're in touch with different people than Brother Nate. We all touch different people. And if we make it our goal just to invite five each week, not all five is going to come. None of the five may even come. But number one, you did what you were supposed to do. Number two, that's five that got an invitation. Now, how do we make that five become live bodies and not just, I'm going to invite five? Make a list. Make a list. Write down one, two, three, four, five. I'm going to invite Sally. She works at Sam's Club. I'm going to invite Sam, who lives down the house, three houses down. I'm going to invite Joe at Goodyear Tires. I'm going to invite Mary at Hospice. And I'm going to invite Edith from Lowe's. Now I've got five names with five locations and I'm going out Friday morning and I'm going to hit all five locations. Now I have a goal. I have a plan. I have a purpose. They say if you write it down, it will get done. If you put it here, it's going to slip your memory. Okay, so we need to learn. There are many things about networking that we can incorporate within the church because that's basically what we do that's what soul winning is is networking because we are networking with the world around us if you know your harvest field then you will work your harvest field jesus was an invitation was in the invitation business you who are weary come you who are thirsty, come. Ye who are hungry, come. Ye who are burdened, come. Does that sound like the invitation business to you guys? Jesus was in the invitation business. So make your goals. Create your connections that will last. Because as you start, and I'm going to tell you something. When you go into um, Sam's Club and you invite Sally to church, You've made a connection. Next time you walk in Sam's Club, Sally's going to do one or two things. She's going to run and hide. Or she's going to say, hey, Jackson, I'm still coming. I know I told you I would be there this Sunday, but I didn't make it. But I'm still planning on it. Because now she's got a face. She's got an obligation. There's been a commitment made. And the chances of getting Sally to church are greater than if, oh, hi, here's the church business card. Come be with us one service. Big difference. Now, how can you make a difference at church? And we're almost done. But at church, if you're on the platform, get off the platform. Matthew, I did not mean for your praise group to quit being in the praise group. When 
you see somebody, which y'all don't go to the platform at last till the pretty much the last minute, but greet the visitors. Before y'all congregate over here to pray, greet the visitors. Make sure you tell them hello. When practice is over, come out here and greet your visitors. Find a place to pray so your visitors see you praying. That's very important. They need to come into the sound of praying, not the sound of chitter-chatter about last night's barbecue. Okay? But we need to make sure that we our visitors are greeted. We need to make sure that we show ourselves friendly. Make sure you have on right guard and left guard and breath mints and your hair is combed and you smell nice, okay? Because we want them to come back, not run. Get out of your click. Okay? Now. We have, and we have it here, we have a little group that will sit here. And a little group that'll sit here, and a little group that'll sit here, and a little group that'll sit here. And I've come up here and sat here and watched these little groups. Nobody's being cliquish, nobody's being clannish, nobody's being mean or hateful, okay? There is a difference between a clique and just your little groups. But to a visitor that is not part of us, and maybe this young person that came in doesn't know this youth group that's sitting over here talking. Get up, go get that young person. Say, come on over here and join us. Get to know them so that they come back. We had um, an elderly lady that was here a couple of services ago. She sat right there. Can anybody remember her? Anybody remember her name? I went to visit her Saturday. She's 73 years old and her name was Magnolia. Okay, scoop her in. Some of our older ladies in the church, scoop her in because she, people's going to feel comfortable with people close to their age group or close to their um, backgrounds. So we need to scoop people in and make them feel. I went over there and just talked to her, told her how beautiful her name was and all this stuff. We need to come out of our shells to bring them out of their shells. Okay, we need to make sure that we are mingling. I don't care how many of we uh, you, young people, y'all go on to Wendy's after church and you've got the Lone Ranger over here. Ask them to come to Wendy's with you. If they tell you they don't have any money and y'all can't come up with it among yourselves, come see me. Okay? Because we want to make them feel like they're part of the group. Because people who take ownership of where they're at and feel comfortable, they're going to come back. Okay, and look, I know it's not all about food, but this is America. What's our number one pastime? Eating. What's a Pentecostal's number one pastime? Eating. Okay, so, you know, we get together. We may go to Krispy Kreme after church and have a donut and a cup of coffee. Include everybody in. Even if they don't come, you've made the invitation. Okay. Coach others. To replicate. Sister Andrea, as you continue growing in God and you're winning souls and you won Sister Sally Sue over here, start coaching Sally Sue to replicate herself and bring in somebody else. Hey, Sally, what about your roommate? Can you reckon she might want to come to church with us this week? Teach others to replicate themselves. Make visitors our priority. You can get the visa copies of the visitors' cards too. Just let me know so that five of us don't bombard somebody at the same day. But you can get Cub's sister um, Nate took copies of all of our visitors' cards and sent everybody invitations to the revival. Okay? I took the visitors' cards from the revival and went and visited all of them Saturday. So somebody else can say, hey, Sister Jews Pan, how about if I take the visitors' cards this week and I go visit? So that a different face has said, hey, church really enjoyed having you here. I want you to come back and be with us again. So, see, there's something that all of us can do. And if you're not, there are some people that absolutely do not like going out and knocking on a stranger's door. I understand that. So, but if you can't do that, sit down and write them a note saying, hey, my name is 
Sister Nathan, I'm from Life Church. You were here this past Sunday. We enjoyed having you so much. Want to send you an invitation back. We've got a lady that comes to church infrequently, but she's been here numerous times in the past year and a half that I've been here. She came one time the first week we were here. And then a few weeks later, she came again. You know why she came back? Because I sat down and wrote her a note telling her how much I enjoyed her being here. And I don't like to handwrite notes, but I just felt led to handwrite her a note. And she said, you don't know how much that meant to me to get a handwritten note. Little things. People want that personal touch. Be sensitive to people around you and their needs. Don't huff and puff in the mo- at the mom in front of you wrestling with kids and trying to empty her grocery cart. Offer to help her. Maybe a single mom. And those kids may be on her last nerve that day. Invite her to church. Play with the kids while she unloads the cart. Are you better yet if you're a man? Jackson, unload the cart for her. Offer to push it to her car. Say, hey, no offense. I just know you're having trouble trouble here with the kids let me help you out to the car with your groceries here's a church track come be with us okay but it's making that personal touch the elderly man that you see sitting in heart he's all by himself drinking a cup of coffee looking lost walk over to him say hello buy him a biscuit he may have just lost his wife this week we need to be sensitive to people around us A child that is crying because mom said, not today, honey, on the coloring book. Ask mom if it's okay and then buy the coloring book for the child. Because sometimes that mom is trying to decide between a coloring book for her child or a gallon of milk for the table. It's putting ourselves in others' places and reaching out to touch them. Little acts of kindness goes a long way. There's a gentleman here in town that for the last three months I have carried him at the end of the month groceries. He calls me, um, he's called me twice and I've done it three times and he'll say, I'm, I'm just, I'm out of coffee and I'm out of butter and I'm out of bread. That's all I need. So I'll go get him coffee and bread and I usually throw a couple other things in and I carry it to him. And this past time that I carried it to him, he said, Mrs. Yuzapan, I said, yes, sir. He said, I don't meet many people who care anymore. And he said, when y'all get into that new building, I can't do much because he has one leg and he can't walk. He's wheelchair bound. He said, I can't do much, but I can come and I can sit there and encourage y'all or I may be able to move a board across the room with my wheelchair. He said, I will come and help y'all. That's a contact that is a soul that we are reaching out for. So we need to be sensitive to those around us. We're a techie world. Use it to your benefit. Send texts to remind someone God loves them. Invite them to church again. Do something strange. Write a paper note. As we've already said, there's so many things that we can do to reach the world. But too many times. How many invited somebody to church this week? Y'all hate it when the pastor asks it. Or people. I shouldn't say y'all. People hates it when the pastor asks it. Because they know that they hadn't done it. And there's really no reason not to. You know this is probably the easiest age. To invite people to church. And the least active. And it's a shame. I want to read you something. I read this years ago, and I, it came back to my memory last night, so I went and I looked it up. But this says a lot. One day, a woman named Louise fell asleep in her bed and dreamed a very fitful dream. She dreamed that someone in hell had written a letter to her, and it was to be delivered to her by a messenger. The messenger passed between the lakes of burning fire and brimstone that occupies hell, And found his way to the door that would lead him to the outside world. Louise dreamed that the messenger walked to her house. Came inside and gently but firmly woke Louise up. He gave her the message saying only that a friend had written it to her from hell. Louise in her dream with trembling hands took the letter and read. My friend, 
I stand in judgment now and feel that you're to blame somehow. On earth I walked with you day by day and never did you point the way. You knew the Lord in truth and glory, but never did you tell his story. My knowledge then was very dim. You could have led me safely to him. Though we lived together on earth, you never told me of the second birth. And now I stand this day condemned because you failed to mention him. You taught me many things that's true. I called you friend and trusted you. But now I've learned that it's too late. You could have kept me from this awful fate. We walked by day and talked by night. And yet you showed me not the light. You let me live, love, and die. You knew I'd never live on high. Yes, I called you friend in life. Trusted you through joy and strife. And yet, on coming to the end, I cannot now call you my friend. After reading this letter, Louise awoke. The dream was still so real in her mind and sweat popped from her body in pools. She swore that she could still smell the burning smell of brimstone and smoke from her room as she contemplated the meaning of her dream. And she realized that as a Christian, she had failed in her duty to go into all the world and preach the gospel. As, the, as she thought of that, she promised herself the very next day she would call her friend Marcia and invite her to church with her. The next morning, she called Marcia, and this was the conversation. Hello, Bill. Is Marcia there? Louise, you don't know. Marcia was killed last night in a car accident, and I thought you knew. Ladies and gentlemen, we're not here. Ladies and gentlemen, we are not all called to pastor, I'm sorry, but we are all called to serve. Going forward, if we hold a, if we hold a leadership position within this church, we will also hold a position of servitude. Because if you cannot be a servant, you cannot be a leader. And I've gotten this approved by the pastor. This rule will reveal many things about me and about you. Because if I cannot serve my fellow man, if I cannot serve my church, if I cannot serve my God, then I have no business sitting here trying to be an example. We live in a thirsty, coming to an end, we live in a thirsty and hurting world that is tired of fake religion and false Christians. We are living in the shadow of a real eternity. Where would you be? Where would your circle of influence be? And what excuses will you offer God when we stand before him? We have an obligation and a work to do. Let us join together before the throne and hear him say, Well done, thy good and faithful servant. And that is my soul's desire. That not only do I hear him say those words, but I can look to my right and look to my left and see the souls that I helped influence into the kingdom of God. That would be a, the greatest reward is to know not only that I and my family made it, but that I helped others make it into the kingdom of God. Let's all stand. Lord, we love you and we thank you for this opportunity to come together and to study your word and to learn more about leadership so that we can go out and lead our community, God, lead others and replicate you, God, to this world. And Lord, we thank you, God, and we thank you for teaching us more about soul winning, God, and the importance, God. And Lord, I ask that you lay souls upon our hearts, God. Give us a burden, God. Show us a glimpse of the eternity that many are facing, God. Show us the glimpse of the eternity, God, that our families are facing if we don't do our part, God. Yes, we know that the decision is theirs, God, and that it's between you and them, God, but we do have an obligation, God, to reach out. Help us, God, as we reach our community. Help us, God, as we reach, God, family and friends, God, and our circle of influence, God. Help us, God, open the doors with the words of wisdom and the words of knowledge, God. Open our mouths, God, for your glory, your kingdom, God. Let everything we do, God, be done according to your will, for your glory, for the salvation of the world, God. That your house may be full as your scripture commands us, God. Move, God, on our church, God. Put a burden on the souls of our church, God, so that we can reach the souls of our community, Lord. We love you and we praise you and we thank you, God. You are holy and you are mighty. We give you glory and we give you honor, God. In Jesus' name, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Now go with each member that's here tonight, 
God and got them safely home. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.